Hi everybody, welcome back if you're a return customer and welcome if you're a first timer to the 2017 Small Farms Winter Webinar Series hosted by University of Illinois Extension's Local Food Systems and Small Farms Team. Uh, my name is Andy Larson. I'll be your moderate, moderator today. I'm one of the local food systems and small farms educators. I'm housed up in northwestern Illinois in Ogle County. We appreciate you joining us for this webinar and other webinars. Uh, we'll do our best to begin and end within the space of your lunch hour. Um, as usual, it's tight time frame. We're going to go uh, as fast as we can comfortably go, but please do understand why we are limiting your questions to the text box at the left. Um, I will do my best to make sure our presenter sees everything uh, either during the presentation or towards the end if we need to wait. Uh, this presentation is being recorded. I will email a link to the archived recorded version of this presentation as soon as possible. After this concludes, it'll be up on our YouTube channel, Illinois Local Foods. Uh, there will also be, as usual, a short link, or excuse me, a link for a short online evaluation of this presentation. And um, we would very, very much appreciate your feedback both on this webinar and what we can do in future webinars. Okay, this week we're going to be hearing from Doug Gucker. Doug is one of my colleagues on the local food systems and small farms team. He is a, oh, he's a guru in so many regards. Um, soils and soil health, agronomy, certified crops advisor, bees, sheep. Oh, God, what else are you into, Doug? Just about anything. <laughs> As my wife says, too much. Ah, too much. Uh, either way, he's a, a heck of a good guy. Um, we really are happy to have him here today. And I know that beekeeping is not only a popular topic, but also a challenging topic in these last, um, oh, I don't know, five or more winters. So, Doug, make us smart, my friend. Okay. Well, thank you, Andy. And hello, everyone. Um, I work down here in central Illinois. Uh, I'm a hobby beekeeper. And the reason I chose this topic, talking about parasitic mite syndrome, is I learned about it the hard way last year. And so I'm hoping by presenting this that I can save you from the mistakes that I have made in the past and that you can move forward and uh, become a better beekeeper and have bees that survive year round and don't have to repla be replaced every spring. Um, we've been battling this issue in the United States and around the world about bee colony losses and this slide you see here um, it points out it's from the bee informed group which is a group of universities in the USDA uh, you can see we've been having unsustainably high losses for the past 10 years much higher than we had 20 years ago and so We've been grappling, the industry has been grappling with why this has been occurring. Here is the latest results for the annual bee colony losses from the spring of 2015 to the spring of 2016. And you can see for the state of Illinois, we had over 46% loss of colonies. This and you can see states around us had, in some cases, over 50% loss of their hives. This is just not sustainable. And we've been calling it chronic colony collapse disorder. We've been calling it lots of things. But over the past 20 years, there's been a group of researchers kind of working on this. And they're come up with a variety of things that are killing our bees. I mean, we have parasites, we have varroa mites, we've got habit destruction out there. We don't have near as many pollinating habitats out there in the wild as we used to have. 
the countryside down here in central Illinois, I call it kind of sterile. I mean, it's very productive for corn and soybeans, but if you're a bee, you can only really collect pollen during a corn pollinating time, and that's kind of it. And so they're really, it's really hard for bees. They've got poor nutrition. You add to that diseases. Then we have our winter weather, our cold springs that you add on top of that. And so we've got a lot of things that are working against our bees, as well as some of our new pesticides. So, as I said, researchers have been working on this chronic colony collapse. Europe experienced this sooner than, sooner than we did in the United States, but they also had a pest appear there sooner than it appeared here in the United States. And that pest was the Varroa mite. And so back in 2010, this uh, research article was actually written uh, by a European, but he talks about, and I quote, while it is impossible to identify a single factor which on its own can account for all colony losses of the world, it is clear that several biological and environmental factors acting alone or in combination have the potential to cause premature colony mortality. Certain honeybee diseases and parasites have been shown to play a significant role in increased honeybee colony mortality. This is what we're calling, and this is what it, the groups have been calling, the parasitic mite syndrome. So, you don't know what the parasitic mites are here in the Midwest. In Illinois, we're particularly affected by tracheal mites. Most of our bees have resistance to the tracheal mites. We've, we, uh, beekeepers have developed, have bred for this over the years, and so that isn't really as much of an issue as it once was. However, the varroa mite, and don't you love its, uh, its actual Latin title, Varroa Destructor. Uh, this mite um, is not native to North America, nor to Europe. Um, is a real parasite predator. I won't say it's a predator, but a real parasite of the European honeybee. And the European honeybee so far has not developed a real good countermeasure to defeat it, particularly when we enclose them in hives. But if you have any questions about parasitic mites of honeybees, as you can see, uh, I've got down here at the bottom uh, where you can download this publication from uh, Greg Hunt over at Purdue. Uh, very good on describing the parasitic mites of honeybees and some of the ways, some of the various IPM strategies we can use to defeat them. Uh, so once again, uh, just take a look at that and uh, download it for your file because it's got great pictures and it's a great resource. And the link is also over on the left now, Doug. Ah, thank you. The Honeybee Coalition, uh, back in January of this year, they just put out, as I said in the beginning, a new tool for all of us to use. Uh, and that's what I'm going to be spending most of my time kind of talking about as I go along. But in their preface, this is what they had to say about the Varroa mite and its effect on colony loss uh, in the United States and Canada. And I would have to agree. Every bee colony in the continental United States either has varroa mites today or will have them within several months. We have varroa mites in Illinois. We have it in all parts of Illinois. We have small hive beetles in all parts of Illinois. They have worked their way here. They are here. Even if you've never done anything and your bees have been in this secluded island all by themselves out in the middle of the country like mine are, they're there. They're coming in, they're on wild bees, on our, on our native bees, they are coming in on uh, our, honey, our, our feral honey bees that have escaped from hives, they're out there. 
The Varroa mite infestation represents one of the greatest threats to honeybee health, honey production, and pollination services that we face here in the United States. We have to effectively con control these mites to reduce our colony losses. The other thing we have to remember is, is that if we lose a colony, other bees come in and rob the honey out of these colonies. They take back the infectious diseases that also come along with these mites and the weakening of the hives and take those back to their hives, if not take, taking back a load of varroa mites with them on their return trip. So this is extremely important in all regards for everyone that we've got to do a good job. Everyone needs to do a good job so that we can get this mite problem under control, which is devastating our bee industry in the United States and around the world. This coalition is made up of over 40 organizations and agencies. It's across the spectrum of government conservation and universities this is this is a big effort i mean we're we're really the united states is moving forward in this they're using all the resources available because we're actually coming at this a little late so the varroa mite it's a pest of the european honeybee it feeds on brood and adults it attaches to adult bees and it moves with these bees. It rides with them when they go out to forage. It rides with them when they go to uh, rob another hive. It's with them. It, care, it, goes wherever it, it goes wherever the bee goes. Look at the size of this thing. You can see on that slide what one millimeter is. This, the female is over a millimeter. You can see these with the naked eye on the back of bees. They're huge in regard. It's like having a huge, and I mean huge, tick on your back. The size of a book or a laptop that you're carrying around with you on your back that's sucking fluids out of your body. This is, the, this is what makes these so nasty. They also are, have been shown, and I'm going to show a little bit more about this, they transmit a lot of viral diseases. And they have been named the most damaging pest of honeybees. So, another place you can look if you're wanting to identify any kind of bee mite, Besides tracheal mite, if you come across something a little unusual, is this bee mite ID. Uh, just Google it on the web. It pops up. It's a joint effort of the USDA and the University of Michigan. Very good. It has mites from all over the world, not just here in the United States. So it, I guess it's kind of preparing us for when the next invader comes from across the oceans. But here, this is what's important. In a 2013 USDA survey of bee, honeybee pests and diseases, they found that there was virus present in the samples submitted in over 80% of those samples. This is not good. This is showing us that we've got a lot of viral load, a lot of disease load in our hives, and this is also leading to our weakening of our hives, and our hives then become more inclined to failing and, and dying off, as mine did. So we need to keep this in mind. And one of our biggest ones that we're seeing a lot of is the DWV that's deformed wing virus. I'm going to talk a little bit more about as we go along. This is something you can easily spot. As well as sac brood virus is also transmitted. So this is what the varroa mite looks like on the back of a bee. 
This is what Varroa mites, uh, the picture on the right, is what the Varroa mites look like when they're feeding on brood inside a cell. This, this larva has been pulled out of, it, out of a cell. And this is, this is what they're doing. These, these are big pests. They're not like our tracheal mites. They're tiny, near micro, almost microscopic. These are big pests on a bee. And what makes it even worse, as you notice, the blue line here on this graph that just popped up is when honeybee populations, they peak, you know, during the peak of the summer, uh, early summer, whenever our maximum pollen uh, and flower flow is, and this is where as beekeepers we try to keep that going as long as we can, but Varroa mites, on the other hand, they build up slowly through the season and their populations actually peak as bee populations are declining. And this is why it makes it so devastating. When the, when the, the mite population is at its highest and bees are laying brood, that's going to be sealed and used for next spring and for the overwintering population to get the hive through the winter. It's going to be infested with roa mites and its chances of survival through the winter are greatly reduced. This is what makes this pest so nasty. Not only is it a big parasite that's attacking and feeding on the bees, but it attacks when it's at its prime and size in largest population is when bees are going into dormancy and are needing to prepare for winter. Very, this is what makes this so nasty. So, what we have to remember now is we've got to use a variety of colony hive integrated pest management strategies. There is no silver bullet. There is no one single thing that is going to cure it. We don't have any, there's nothing magical. Beekeeping has gone from being an easy once a month, not that hard a thing to do, to being a, a weekly, if not daily chore, just like any other livestock you would own or any pet you would have. We've got to use cultural practices. I'm going to go into that. We've got to have rigorous hive monitoring every week. We need to, the use of mite tolerant genetic stock, sampling for mites. If we have mites, we've got to practice rotation of our chemical controls. And we have a variety of those. But these mites have developed resistance to a lot of our synthetic miticides to some degree. And we've got to keep our mite levels below two to five mites per hundred adult bees. It used to be we said 10 mites or less per hundred adults. We are now saying, and I'll go into this more in depth, that depending upon the time of year, even two mites is too many per 100 bees. These are significant. These are significant differences than we had even five years ago. So our cultural practices, what can we do? Just simple things that we can do to, to make our bees healthier. Always locate your hives in a sunny location. We have found, research has found that the Varroa mite doesn't survive as well during the high heat of summer. And if hot hives are in shade, they actually survive in there much, much better. And well, actually they thrive in those hives. And so a hot hive, uh, which we would think would be not good for our bees, actually in this case is better for them because the Varroa mite doesn't like hot temperatures. 
The other thing to remember is, is that a hive in the sun that's up off the ground, the soil under it is going to be drier and we're going to disrupt the small hive beetle life cycle. So we've got an opportunity to work on two different bee pests here with just simply keeping our hives in a sunny location. The other simple thing we can do is use screen bottom boards. If we're using bees that have some type of hygienic behavior that, that, grew, that uh, genetically do lots of grooming and they pull off the mites off of each other, those mites then fall to the ground because they pass through that screen bottom board. The good news is varroa mites aren't climbers. They're clingers, but they aren't walkers. They aren't. They they don't travel very far, so they're not going to climb back up into a hive. Once they fall on the ground, they're gone. And the other thing we can do is use drone comb, because drones, as hopefully you know, are is a larger cell uh, than the worker bee. Uh, brood cells, and so this is a preferred laying site for Varroa because it's a larger la larva that they can feed on, and so you always want to have a big healthy host to feed on, so they prefer to lay their eggs on drone comb in drone cells, so this is a way we can do that, and then we just need to destroy uh, the drone and that comb before the drone emerge, that way we kill the varroa. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. Here's drone comb. It's, a, it's just another integrated pest management technique, but the cell that's imprinted on these drone combs are a larger size so that the worker bees draw it out to be drone size cells, and so that's what the queen lays in there are drone eggs. Varroa are five to twelve times more likely to lay their brood in a drone cell than in a worker bee cell. So this is where this strategy can be very helpful. The thing we have to remember is drones emerge in 24 days after the queen lays its egg. So we want to remove that drone comb by day 21 put it in the freezer for 48 hours, pull it out of the freezer, everything is dead then, and examine a few, open up a few of those drone cells, pull out some of the drone uh, pupa, and if there are any, quote, red dots on those, uh, that will be dead varroa mites, and it gives you an idea just if you've got a lot of infected drone uh, cells in there, then you know you've got a, a, this is another way you know you have a hive roller load in that hive and you need to be taking some action immediately. The other thing we need to do is we need to do weekly visual inspections. One of the first things we need to look for, do we have a uniform brood pattern or is it spotty as we see here in this in this picture. It's not uniform, it's spotty. What's going on? What have we got a lot of eggs in there? I see some eggs, some of those white dots in the bottom of some of those cells, but I see a lot of open cells. None of this is a good sign. We've got some problems there, so we need to watch. We need, need to take some action and find out what's happening. Do we have a bad queen, a queen that's old, it's not laying? What has happened? What is going on? And so we need, this is our first sign. We need to take some type of action, begin to do something to investigate what's going on. The other thing we need to look for is just visually see if we see any of these varroa mites climbing on capped brood cells or where we see them inside a brood cell growing on some of the larvae before it's capped. The other thing to look for, and this is just what we should look for anyway, is does the hive seem more agitated than normal? Uh, that can be a sign that something is affecting the hive. Uh, do we have web uh, webworm in there? Uh, hive, uh, webworm in there? Uh, do we have 
a small hive beetle? You know, is there a mouse that's gotten in there? What's going on that's got them agitated? Uh, and then the other thing we want to watch for if you is to notice how your bee population is doing. Is it increasing like we would normally expect? If we're beginning to get into warmer weather as that happens. Um, and then during the summer, the populations explode and we hopefully get up over a million bees in our hive, per hive. Um, and then you, if you notice any decline in that adult population, that's an immediate uh, sign that take action, find out immediately what's going on. And that's why we're doing this weekly. The other thing is, is we need to pay attention for deformed wing virus. And I've got a picture of that right here. And as you can see, this is one picture, but what it is is these worker bees can't fly. What happens? They come out of the hive, they, they come, they chew out of their cell uh, on the 21st day after the eggs laid and they begin working in the hive. Well around day 35 or so, uh, that's when they begin to get towards the foraging part of when the work, as, they, as the worker bee matures, the last thing she does is foraging. If she can't fly, there's no foraging. If there's no foraging, there's no food for the hive. And so within 21 days, the cycle, the birth cycle of worker bees, you can have a hive collapse. And so this is why these weekly monitorings are so important. We can't do it every couple of weeks or every four weeks because we can totally miss something like this going on in our hive. So Doug, we quick do question the... back on the drone comb. Uh-huh. Uh, should they, after it comes out of the freezer, I presume is what uh, TK is asking, should we then uncap and replace the drone comb back in the hive for reuse? Um, oh. Cleaning it first, of course. Oh, actually, actually, the bees, since it's dead, will clean that all out by themselves. Since everything is dead, they will dispose of it. Gotcha. The key thing is, is that we want to do some inspection of those capped cells, those capped dead cells, to see what kind of mite load is in them or not in them. So that we know whether to continue doing this, because we have, you have to understand when you, when the queen is laying drone comb, she's not laying as many worker bees. And so we, we have to have a careful balance with this. We can't overdo drone comb, otherwise we don't have any worker bees. And so we only typically do this when we are at our, at reaching our peak numbers of bees, you know, during the prime uh, pollen and nectar flow time of, you know, late spring, early summer. This is when we, we want to put these procedures in place. All right, and then a, a question related to the deformed wing virus. If we note DWV, should we feed the bees? Actually, uh, f feeding, you, you can feed the bees, but the critical thing is, is we've got to get that, that mite load under control because as long as we have that virus in the hive and the mites are spreading that virus you're going to have sh you're just going to have sugar water fed bees and we've got to get them healthy again we've got to get rid or reduce that virus load by reducing those mites in the colony that's Good. what's critical Thanks, Doug. Okay. So, if you, if you want to record a hive inspection, which is good because, once again, by week four, your memory could be getting a little fuzzy, and you're going to be doing this for 30-plus weeks through the season, possibly, uh, you're going to want to have some kind of a record. You can keep it on paper. Here, here's a model form here that came from Florida. You can set something like this up on a spreadsheet. That make, that'll make Andy happy since spreadsheets will rule the world one day. And 
but if that's not your thing the good news is we've got hive inspection apps you can put them on your phone or your tablet there if they've got them for android they got them for the i o s operating system uh... you're it's uh... so you you've got a lot of opportunities that you can look at so you need to keep that in mind and if you're a if you're a commercial beekeeper the one thing you need to uh... Is, is that there is a tremendous amount of commercial beekeeping software out there for you. So, my, what, my point is here, find a way to keep track of your weekly inspections, whether it's on paper, whether it's on your phone or a tablet or the computer, whatever it is, find a way that works for you because we've got all the tools out there so that you can keep track of what's going on in your hive, you know, going on in your hive. And also, it's a good way for you to get a handle on how well you're doing as a beekeeper which is tremendously important with the pest load and pressure that our bees are under currently. This is just so important. The other thing, the next thing, the next part of the puzzle of this integrated pest management strategy for our hives is the use of mite tolerant genetic stock. Um, some of you hopefully may have heard you know about the varroa sensitive hygienic bees these were developed up in minnesota uh, and they've been around for a long time uh, russian bees uh, there's been quite a program developing russian bees what's the big deal or what's so special about russian bees they actually live where the varroa might in in the original site for where the varroa mite is. They've actually have developed their own resistance to the varroa mite. And so uh, it's not 100% resistance, but they are very good at dealing with the varroa mite, especially when you add other pest management strategies on top of them. We also have hygienic bees. Our bee, this is the mite grooming behavior. You've probably heard about almost every bee breeder in the United States has been working on bees that groom. The idea that they pick this mite off because if it gets picked off and you've got the bottom screen boards, they fall through and it's another way we reduce that mite load. <coughs> Excuse me. The, the, the last thing is, is the Indiana Mite Biters. I, I love the name of that. Indiana Mite Biters. Uh, this, this is brand, these are brand new. This is uh, coming out of uh, a Purdue University bee breeding program. And these bees actually bite the legs off of the varroa mite. And so they literally fall off the bees because they can't hold on anymore. And so uh, it's actually terminal for those mites. Whether they fall out of the hive or not, uh, they uh, it's just another strategy. And so we've got lots of things going on right now. So the idea is, is that when you're requeening, Whenever you're talking to whoever you're buying your queen from, the first question you should say is, are these mite tolerant or do they have a groom, mite grooming behavior? You, you want to get from them that they've got some kind of, these bees have some mechanism to cope with the varroa mite. And the last statement, mite tolerant bees help, help. They aren't the solution. They help to counter the high reproductive capacity of the varroa mite. The varroa mite goes from egg to adult in seven days. So within a brood cell, we can have a couple of generations of varroa mites actually 
breeding and reproducing in that cell. This is quite, quite, as I keep saying, this is quite a pest. So, the next thing we have to do is we're doing, we're implementing all these various strategies, hives in the sun, bottom boards, uh, use of, of drone comb, per, uh, dur particularly during the peak population period of the bees. We're, we're doing visual inspections to make sure that they're staying healthy and we don't have another we don't have a disease or mites or something else affecting our bees and everything's looking good and the egg laying is looking good and uniform. We're doing all those things. Now we need to sample at least four times a year for mites, varroa mites, just to make sure and verify that we're actually doing as good a job as we think we're doing. And so when do you do this? Well, you know, obviously you don't want to sample uh, this time of the year because if you if you start pulling out 200 or 300 or 400 bees out of a hive to sample, you're, you may end up pretty well decimating your hive uh, or setting it back severely. We begin doing this once we get into the, the peak nectar flows, which this year may be earlier than normal. We do one then. We then do a couple during our, when, the, when the hive is near, you know, near and at its peak population, when you've got all the supers on there and things are just uh, humming along, literally humming along. And, and then we want to do one last one as we approach the end of the season. So, you know, Labor Day in this area, you know, as things are slowing down the end of August, as things are slowing down and fewer flowers are in bloom and the days are getting longer and begin to get cooler, uh, nights get cooler, the bees know it's that time, it's to prepare for the winter season, the dormant season. We want to do one last one to just make sure that our mite numbers are low because remember, the fall of the year is when mite populations, if they're going to explode, will explode. And so this is our last chance to make sure that we're doing as good a job as we think we're doing. So minimum of four times a year. If you need to do apply a treatment due to a sampling, you then of course resample just to make sure that that treatment was effective. If you use the miticide and it wasn't effective, you immediately know that your particular mites have a resistant to resistance to that particular type of miticide. So, how do you how many hives do you sample? Well, if you got less than 10 hives, you sample every hive. So, and we want a sample of between 200 and 400 bees. So here just gives you a rough idea. A quarter of a cup of bees is roughly 200 bees and a half a cup of bees is about 300 bees. And so I use a half a cup um, just mainly because, and I'll show you some more about that in a, just a second. Uh, in larger colonies, if we've got larger producers, um, 10 hives or more, we're going to collect 300 adult bees from one brood frame in each of eight randomly selected hives. So I, we're going to run eight samples from eight randomly selected hives. Once again, just to check and make sure that our mite populations are as low as we think they are. I I use the powder sugar roll. Um, Minnesota started talking about this. Um, here's a poster you can download. Um, uh, this came out of Marla Spivix, Dr. Spivik's uh, bee lab up there in Minnesota, and she's the one who developed the, uh, the Varroa, the VHS, the Varroa sensitive hygiene, whatever. Uh, and uh, so she, 
Yeah, she's been working on this a long time. In fact, she's retired now. But this gives you an easy visual on how you do it. And you can download this. Uh, and I'll bring that link up in just a minute. But I want to point out, down here in this box, if you read it, it says, if you know how many bees are in your sample, you can estimate the number of mites per 100 bees. If there's brood in the colony when you sample, you double the number of mites found to account for the amount of mites in the worker brood. So if you find five mites per 100 adult bees, you would then say, I have at least 10 mites per bee. And remember, our threshold now for treating uh, is much lower than what this old uh, publication shows where it says 10 mites per 100. And we're now down to 2 to 5. So, but you can download this. The reason for doing it is if you've never done this before, it's a real simple way to do it. If you don't want to make up one of these sampling jars, you can actually just go to the University of Minnesota and type in powder sugar roll and they will sell you a kit on how to do uh, th so you can do it yourself and it's got the jar it's got everything so you can do that as well so now then you can also find detailed instructions for doing not only the powder sugar roll but the ether ether roll the alcohol roll uh, but those two, uh, the bees don't survive. Powder sugar roll is non-destructive. Uh, the bees, even though you shake them and they're totally covered in powdered sh confectionery sugar, uh, when they come out, they're still alive. That's not the case with the alcohol and ether. Uh, they're, they're dead. Uh, and so uh, that's why I use the powder sugar method. But if you go and you look on pages seven and eight, and you can see right there's the lengthy link where you can download that. Um, Tools for ROA Management, a guide to effective ROA sampling and control. This is the new publication with the new guidelines that was put out in January of 2017 of this year. And so this has got the latest, most up-to-date information it covers a variety of issues, not only the sampling, control measures, what you can do if you find them, the thresholds, here's the thresholds, there are new thresholds, and as you can see, this is far different than our old threshold of 10 mites per 100. We're now saying during the winter time, we should be finding less than one bee per 100 bees when we're in the dormant season. So this is, in other words, we shouldn't hardly find them. During our decrease at the end of the fall of the year, we should be finding less than two per hundred. So this is really different. Once again, if we're finding over two, this is where we need to be monitoring that high very closely to see if we need to be a, enact some type of a control, chemical control measure. And as you can see, if we ever approach or reach five, uh, we're in the danger and we need to be doing something yesterday. So we've got a variety of chemical mite control products out there. We've got the synthetic chemicals, uh, Apivar, Apistatin, Apistan, uh, Check Mite Plus. These are all uh, uh, pesticides. Um, there has been some level of resistance uh, to some of these, and so they're still effective, but uh, um, once again, um, there are no silver bullets here, no silver bullets. Our essential oils, uh, once again, they're effective. Uh, 
as with the synthetic chemicals, they have to be used with caution. We have restrictions on when we can use them, what time and the season, if there's any, um, uh, if we have to w withhold honey, if it can be used when the hive has honey. We have all these various things, but very effective. Uh, the, the Apigard, that's thymol, very effective, very irritating to the mites. The AP Life uh, VAR, uh, it's a combination of several uh, essential oils. As you can see, thymol, uh, eucalyptus, eucalyptol, menthol, and camphor. And so, once again, the idea of irritating vapors for the uh, Varroa, and so they dislodge. We've also got what we call the acids, and we have various formulations of formic acid, oxalic acid, as well as hop guards too, which is, come, is derived from hops, uh, the beta acids from hops. And so, once again, they also agitate, aggravate, and uh, dislodge these mites, and in some cases kill them. But the acids have to be used carefully because there's only prescribed amounts per hive, per number of bees, because once again, we're killing an insect on an insect with any of these things we're using. And so they have to, all have to be used with caution. Four, and, and this tools for varroa management, it has over 15 pages towards the end of the manual that deal with all these various chemicals. As you can see, here's where you can download it. If you go to the Honey Bee Health Coalition website, uh, you can download it from there, and it's actually a much shorter uh, link than that one there. But if you do go to that Google Drive, which is where the Honey Bee Health Coalition sends you, there's also uh, a variety of videos showing each aspect of sampling, use of the various products, monitoring, all those different things they've got. It's, it's very, very good, very, very helpful. If you have any questions, you can read. You can read this guide, but then you can also look at videos to kind of drive it home one more time. And so it's all there. And this is, once again, I would say every, every beekeeper should have a copy of this because as we have learned over the past couple years, this mite disease complex is in combination with our habitat change and the pesticide load we have in our environment and our weather conditions that can be nasty for bees sometimes. Um, this seems to be what's breaking the back of our hives and causing the decline is these mite disease complex is just one thing too many for our hives that they were used to with Mother Nature. So, next thing, as a beekeeper. Hold on, is... Doug. Before you move on again, uh, real quick, plantings of thyme or plantings of hops uh, that produce some of those essential oils that were discussed on the last slide, is that of any use for your bee colony? Uh, it is... Uh, any of the mint family, which Time is a member of, um, I believe, but uh, Time and any of the mint family are helpful because the essential oils on all the mints tend to be a little irritating to mites as well. Uh, it is helpful. It's another uh, step that you can add, another uh, leg you can put on your IPM management stool for your bees, but it won't solve the problem. I say that from experience. It won't solve the problem. It will help, but it, it, it doesn't solve it. And so, once again, it's helpful. And if you're doing a good job and keeping that bee load down, it's just another deterrent that's helpful for your bees because they're bringing in this 
this these these essential oils on their backs and their bodies that's being spread through the hive that's helping to aggravate and agitate the mites so they'll dislodge and uh, fall off the bees through that bottom screen board that everyone has on their hive and I would use a bottom screen board even through the winter lots of people don't like that idea but you have to remember that we also need ventilation in our hive through the winter time because as they eat and respire their the bees are uh, letting off moisture and if our hive is closed up tight we then get ice forming in the top of the hive and on warm days that melts we have water then dripping down through the hive and that's just a wonderful place for when any of the many different uh, bee diseases to get started in, particularly when the bees are trying to build up and lay brood and do all these things in the, in the late spring, late winter, early spring. And so leaving the high, leaving the bottom board op on all uh, the screen bottom board on all year long, and then just making sure that you've just got a small top vent opening uh, for your bees to let that humid air escape and your bees will do just fine and they'll be actually be help healthier than if you lock it up tight uh, trying to keep in every little bit of heat they might produce because the reality is it's the bees in the center of that uh, ball that that cluster that they form in the winter and they're constantly rotating themselves in and out of that cluster to stay warm that's how they stay warm so that's what's important but remember that since so important here is worker bees 21 days if we have a lot of worker bees with deformed wing we have no foragers and in three weeks we will have a hive and serious decline and more than likely will be dead in four weeks. It's This is how serious this problem is today. So uh, I'll end right now, you know, be successful, be profitable, but we've got to be out there checking our hives at least once a week to see what's going on because these mites are just everywhere. Uh, I saw a tree come down in Decatur that had a wild honeybee uh, hive up in it and it was loaded with varroa and small hive beetle. And so to me that was the fact that okay they're here, they're everywhere. And so we really just need to understand this, that we're not protected anymore by having our hives all isolated out in the country because these mites are being brought in by other bee, other foraging bees from other hives, and they're being brought in by some of our native pollinators as well. And so we just need to be vigilant and stay on top of it, and we'll be productive, profitable beekeepers. So, any questions? Yeah, there's one over there, Doug, right now. Is there any um, plants that when bees forage at them, they actually provide a mechanical means for um, dislodging the mites? None that... I have seen that none that I've seen it in the research um, and that that's all I can go by there there's been nothing defined in research that shows this and typically any plant that would dislodge this mite from is going to be work for the bee to get the nectar out of anyway and they're probably going to be that's going to be the last plant they're going to want to forage at anyway because if they're already carrying uh, this big pest on their back, they're going to be weak. And so the whole hive is going to be looking for the most available, readily available, easy to get nectar and pollen supply they can find. Not the hardest one, most difficult that they have to crawl and work their way inside of. 
And the other thing is, if it dislodges it in that flower, the next bee that comes along, that mite will get back on it when it leaves. And so um, that, isn't, that isn't the end-all, do-all. Uh, really, what we've got to do is keep track of it and, and use all these various strategies. Hives in the sun, bottom boards, drone cones, visually checking our hives, making sure our queen is viable, laying her eggs, doing the job she's supposed to be doing. All right, Steve is asking regarding oxalic acid. Do you have any preference regarding vaporization versus drip for application? No, my recommendation would be go to that guide see what you have, uh, uh, the guide meaning the tools for Varroa control. They go into quite a bit of detail about oxalic acid and the various formulations that are out there and what's available. And so, and when to use which product. Um, they, they talk about oxalic drip uh, during as being moderately effective, as being moderately effective. Um, and so, and really, they don't really talk at all about oxa oxalic acid vapor. They're really talking about the drip application. And so, um, that's really all I can go by is, is that this is the most current uh, data that we have on this and recommendations is they're recommending the oxalic acid drip uh, currently and following the guidelines, you know, little or no cap brood in the colony. You know, the, these are all part of the things we have to do if we're using oxalic acid. All right, uh, another one. Keeping small cell bees, does the parasitic mite syndrome issue present as much of a problem in that situation as in standard cell bees? Actually, they found no difference in that. There's been some work and they thought that might be the cure uh, or might help. And what they found is, is that the mite just adapts and goes, well, if there's only little cells to lay the eggs in, well, we'll just lay our eggs in the little cells. Mm. Uh, and so um, that if little cells are part of the system in your hive with grown cells and you've got the, you know, once again, this has got to be a, a very thought out strategy and little cells by themselves no they're not the answer little cells with dr with the use of drone comb can be the answer can be the answer can be part of the answer but it's not the solution any other so, questions that are still out there so yeah it it's it, it's a tough one because this is an exotic, this, this, is, this is an invasive species that came in and is attacking our bees. And it was accidentally introduced into this country. And so that's the worst of all worlds. We had no time to prepare for it. And in fact, the Europeans that have been battling this for 10 years longer than we have, they're still struggling with this. And so... Um, this publication, as I said, from the Bee Health, Honey Bee Health Coalition, it's the latest, most accurate, in-depth management guide we have so far. And uh, it really has, uh, as, as I said, um, our thresholds have changed dramatically. Uh, 10 mites down to less than one, depending upon the time of year. That's one heck of a change when you're out there sampling and the old mindset of what we used to think. And so um, the, the fact that we've discovered that this mite also, as well as other mites, they bring other diseases in with them. 
or encourage the presence of other diseases because the hive is weak and it's hard to stave off a uh, disease. This is what the real problem is, is that they just, it wreaks so much havoc within that organized colony. Doug, I'm going to stop you there, and we'll fit within our time frame. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much to Doug Gooker, our local food systems and small farms educator from uh, the Decatur area, for a great presentation, uh, sharing his expertise. Thanks, everybody, for joining us for this webinar. Uh, I hope you got something that you'll be able to use in your endeavors this year. Um, look for an email from me with a link to the archived webinar on the Illinois Local Foods YouTube channel and a short eval of the webinar that you just watched. Uh, we do use your feedback to shape our future programming. Uh, with that, I'm going to stop the recording. Y'all have a fabulous rest of your day.